thank you for coming out to this program in which I will speak to you about my enjoyment of literature, including Shakespeare and poetry, and the dramatic arts and how these influenced me throughout my life. Given the prevalence and importance of the Bible in the frontier life of the early 19th century, it should come as no surprise to you that I would become very familiar with its contents, both the Old and New Testaments. And as events occurred in my life and in our nation, I was often reminded of stories and sayings from the Bible. I'll give you just a couple of examples. When I accepted the nomination of the Republican Party to challenge Senator Stephen Douglas for his U.S. Senate seat in 1858, I gave a speech you might still remember. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I said, citing the words of Jesus, he had used those words to describe the spiritual condition of man. I applied them to the situation of the country with regard to slavery. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. Other than the Bible, I read more of Shakespeare than any other writer or poet. I love Shakespeare for his deep characters and for his genius in capturing human emotions and the human spirit, especially the manifold tragedies of human existence. The great bard's words reflected the experiences of my own life. They became especially powerful and meaningful in the momentous days of our great national crisis. Almost any play of his which I may pick up seemed to speak either to my own situation or that of the country. I once wrote to a Shakespearean actor and told him that I thought that the soliloquy in Hamlet commencing, oh, my offense is rank, surpassed that commencing to be or not to be. I suppose this passage touched me so because as president I was tormented by the horror of our war in which brother fought against brother. The rank offense which haunted King Claudius was none other than his cold-blooded murder of his own brother, the former King Hamlet, father of Prince Hamlet. Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it. A brother's murder. Pray can I not, though inclination be as sharp as will. My stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. And like a man to double business bound, I stand and pause where I shall first begin, and both neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Where to serves mercy but to confront the visage of offense? And what's in prayer but this twofold force, to be forestalled ere we come to fall, or pardoned being down? Then I'll look up. My fault is past. But oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder. That cannot be, since I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder, my crown, mine own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offense. Uh, of course, not all my reading was of a serious nature. I also enjoyed reading humorous works and would share these with my friends and colleagues too. I liked jokes so much that I kept a copy of Joe Miller's Jest in my desk at the White House. This was an old English joke book printed in 1739. Here are just a couple of examples. A lady's age happening to be questioned. She affirmed she was but 40 and called upon a gentleman that was in company for his opinion. A cousin, said she, do you believe I am in the right when I say I am but forty? I ought not to dispute it, madame, replied he, for I have heard you say so these ten years. I first became interested in poetry in my youth. I learned to love especially Shakespeare, but also poets such as Lord Byron, Robert Burns, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, John Greenleaf Whittier, and Oliver Wendell Holmes. I memorized a fair bit of poetry, but I suppose my favorite poem, one which I recited from memory fairly frequently, was one entitled Mortality. It was written by William Knox, a young Scottish poet. It is full of melancholy as it addresses the subject of human mortality, and it seemed to take on an added poignancy amidst all the dying occasioned by the war. I told a friend I would give all that I am worth and go in debt to be able to write so fine a piece as I think that is. In the interest of time, I will read it to you only about one half of the 14 stanzas. <laughs> oh, why should this spirit of mortal be proud? 
like a swift fleeting meteor, a fast flying cloud, a flash of the lightning, a break of the wave, he passes from life to his rest in the grave. I should now like to speak to you about the theater, which I would grow to love not only for the pleasure of its entertainment, but also because it served as my only real distraction from the burden of my office. I saw Hamlet three different times at Grover's Theater in March 1863 with the leading role performed by Edward Lewis Davenport, a year later by Edwin Booth, and the following November by Davenport again. Edwin Booth, by the way, was part of a whole family of actors. His father was Junius Brutus Booth, and who had three sons follow him into the profession. Junius Brutus Jr., Edwin, and uh, John Wilkes. You may have only heard of Edwin as he was considered the greatest of the three. My very first time to see an opera was after I was elected president, during our inaugural trip from Springfield to Washington by train, when we stopped in New York City. It was Giuseppe Verdi's Un Baio in Machera at the Academy of Music. The name translates into English as a masked ball. It was based on another opera, which in turn was inspired by a political assassination, that of Sweden's King Gustav III in 1792. We arrived a little bit late, and we had to leave at the end of the second act, before the final assassination scene. If only I had made that into a habit, to leave the theater, before the final assassination scene. Mm -hmm. 